This program is simulcast on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Schatz. I'm the city's economic development director. I'm also the executive director of the Redevelopment Authority and executive director of Downtown Eau Claire, Inc. So we're holding this idea lounge kind of community engagement to talk about a project that has happened, could happen in the Cannery District here as part of our redevelopment district. So what we like to do is when we have something going on, we like to get feedback, uh, listen to your concerns, listen to what you like, what you don't, ask questions. So uh, we're going to take this opportunity to um, present a proposal that uh, we're uh, talking to a developer now called Wired Properties and I'll be introducing them in a second here. Uh, so the Redevelopment Authority has given them 90 days to talk through their project with the community and get feedback and uh, to negotiate a development agreement and purchase agreement with the Redevelopment Authority. Those dates, uh, those timelines can be extended uh, if we need to, but it's a, it's a chance for them to do the due diligence of finding out what would work in the community, what you think of their idea, and so we're, we're really, really pleased you've taken time out of your uh, busy schedules to come and talk to us. Uh, we we uh, walked your neighborhood and gave out flyers to try and get uh, more attendance. Uh, we've advertised it in volume one on the downtown Eau Claire websites and such, trying to get as many people as uh, we can to attend and get that feedback. For those people who can't attend, there'll be other opportunities that they'll talk about, that they'll be in the community gathering more feedback at different locations. Uh, maybe eventually we'll have a, a, a online way that you can uh, give input to. So we're in the gathering stages and kind of getting getting all of your thoughts on it. So with us today from Wired Properties is Chris Steinhoffel, and with him is Andrew Dane. And they're going to first tell you a little bit about their concept and everything, and then we'll get into uh, what your thoughts are and how you feel and everything. So, uh, I'm Chris Steinhoffel with Wired Properties. Uh, we are a real estate development firm outside or located in Milwaukee. Um, and with me today is Andrew Dane. Yep, I'm and Andrew Dane, and uh, let us know if you can't hear us, by the way, too. Just give us a thumbs up. Or um, So I'm an uh, independent consultant, urban planning consultant, working with Wired Properties on developing these pocket neighborhood projects, and this is really our um, one of our first projects that we're looking to develop these pocket neighborhoods around the state. So really excited to be here, and um, thanks for showing up. Yeah, so like Andrew said, uh, this is the first uh, project we're looking at. Um, so it really is an open book. We're trying to get community feedback, see what would work here. We have an idea of what we want to do, but we don't want to do something that the community doesn't want or will not appreciate. Um, so today, a little agenda, give you a little overview of our firm and what we've done so far. Um, talk about the project pocket neighborhood concept and how it may fit into this neighborhood and fit into Eau Claire. At uh, Wired Properties, uh, we're a real estate developer, but we call ourselves uh, an urban weaving firm. Um, we put a focus on the community and social programming, engagement, trying to get people to interact um, and do developments that fit into the commun community and benefit the community. Um, and we have done a few projects so far, uh, mainly mixed use that uh, you know, work together to tie people, place, and times together and trying to create a sense of community within um, the buildings that we build. So to start out our firm experience, we started uh, back in the late 2000s, right when the recession hit. With these two projects, the Cornerstone and Ravenna, they're in Shorewood, Wisconsin, just north of Milwaukee. These are two mixed-use developments that are residential up above with ground floor retail. Um, next project is Mequon Town Center. Uh, we did a higher density town center in Mequon, and Mequon does not like density. Uh, so we really worked with the community there to find a solution. Uh, that benefited the community and brought everyone together. After that, we worked on a large project down in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. 
uh, an 80 acre site that used to be a manufacturing plant and it's been redone with a new city hall, a library, uh, a town square park and what we focused on was Main Street. We did the entire Main Street corridor with mixed use uh, development as well as uh, commercial development along the main avenue. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about pocket neighborhoods and the concept that we're trying to explore with the community here just down the road and just to kind of put in a little bit of perspective, um, how many folks have heard of this concept of the missing middle housing? Okay, nice. Um, so this, the idea with the missing middle housing is that you know, since um, prior to World War II, the way we built cities is we built cities that were very finely grained with lots of different uses and types of um, residential developments and mixed use developments that really incorporated everything from single family to larger mid-rise uh, structures. And you typically find these mixed in throughout a lot of your inner uh, traditional neighborhoods in and around your downtowns. Um, so in, you see in, in neighborhoods like Eau Claire, in some of the areas, uh, older parts of the city, you see a little bit more of a mix of different building types. Basically, since the World War II and post-World um, post War II, um, <clears throat> the U.S. and their housing development um, uh, process is really only really done detached single-family homes at one end um, and higher density, you know, mid-rise or apartments or, or ta towers at the other end. And so the idea of the missing middle, it's been um, propagated or pushed forward through some different firms is to start focusing on this whole sort of menu or this variety of different housing product types um, that are located between those two extremes. So we can start to build communities that kind of meet a wide range of user needs and kind of accommodate people as they um, go through different stages in their life so they don't have to necessarily move out of their neighborhood. So we're looking at trying to create lots of different options and variety within the middle here um, to create a more vital neighborhoods. Next slide. And so the pocket neighborhoods is kind of right in the middle of that spectrum. Um, <clears throat> it started out in um, Seattle and was sort of popularized through Ross Chapin, who has a company called Cottage Homes, who popularized the, the notion of pocket neighborhood um, going back into, the, I think, the late 90s. Um, but really, this idea kind of got started even earlier than that. If, for those of you that have been out to places like Pasadena or San Diego or LA, you see these, you'll see these smaller sort of bungalow-style courtyard apartment complexes that really are, are uh, somewhat similar to this. And the idea is that you take a group of homes, it's oftentimes 10, 12, 14 homes, you cluster them around a shared green space to create um, kind of a, a community green space. Um, and that you design the homes, you, add a, you pay attention, a lot of attention to the detail and the layout and the site planning so that you uh, maximize opportunities for pedestrian spaces and walkways. The idea is to encourage um, a lot of pedestrian interaction and walkability within the neighborhood and uh, reduce um, the, the influence of the car and traffic a little bit within the neighborhoods. You typically, um, so next slide, uh, Chris. So um, <clears throat> they've typically been done with sort of using this cottage homes architectural style is what most of the pocket neighbors, and, and by most I think about 30 is what we've, Chris has been doing the market research. We think there's been about 30 done nationally. Um, typically about 1,000 to 2,000 square feet. So we're not talking about tiny homes, 200, 300 square feet, little tiny, tiny homes. We're talking about more of the size of homes that you used to see. Um, um, you know, traditionally get built in, in cities. Front porches, so it, it borrows from some of the urban design styles from, say, traditional neighborhood development and new urbanism, so the front porches. Um, active rooms at the front of the house that look over that shared common area. Um, the, the way the houses are sort of laid in and designed and set next to each other, it, even down to the location, the windows is done highly curated so that you still have privacy even though you're on a fairly small lot on a, on a fairly um, tightly nestled in there. Um, and they can have detached or attached garages. So here's a few examples of how um, <clears throat> ways in which you could do pocket neighborhoods. 
The project that we're talking about tonight is really a single cluster, so it's just looking typically at a, at a single block. It might be an acre or two acres or something along those lines, and that can be developed as a single cluster. You know, but we're also looking at other opportunities um, in, the, in, in Wisconsin um, where we might double cluster these, have maybe two pocket neighborhoods connected via pedestrian walkway. And so here is uh, the pro proposed site for the project, just four blocks up on First Street. Um, right now, the land is pretty much vacant, and I'm sure some or almost all of you have seen uh, this design. It was published in volume one. Uh, this was just a preliminary site plan sketch that I drew. Um, it would have 15 cottage homes on the site, uh, sort of in little clusters with that common green space. Uh, one thing we do want to include with this pocket neighborhood is a clubhouse and community center. We want somewhere for people within this little community to be able to gather and have events, um, have parties, maybe dinners, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and then hopefully, you know, this clubhouse community center would also be available to the the public and the surrounding neighborhood. Um, what, and that would be decided by the people that end up living here. Um, but yeah, ho hopefully you know, it, that would be utilized by everyone, not just this community or this micro community. And also on the top left, uh, looking at putting in features such as a dog park. Um, that's a pretty popular item right now. Um, as people are having kids, need space to play or get a dog rather than have a kid. Um, like myself, uh, it's nice to be able to take your dog somewhere and let them run around off leash uh, where they won't get into trouble. Um, since then, we, we've sort of redrawn it pretty much the same um, with dog park and the homes. Uh, these homes are all the same cookie cutter shape and laid out right here. We don't plan on that being the case when we actually uh, would build this neighborhood. We'd want a variety of homes, one story, two story, uh, ranging that spectrum from 1,000 to 2,000 square feet. Uh, and what actually ends up happening will depend on what people want uh, that are buying the homes as well as the surrounding community and the various stakeholders that it affects. Right here is an example of a um, simple home. 28 by 38 foot house, uh, has the front porch. Uh, the design right here has an attached garage. We, whether we do attached or detached really depends on what people want. Uh, personally, I would prefer more detached homes than attached homes, just getting people out of their homes, walking and having interaction with their neighbors uh, as they walk to their house, rather than driving into the garage, parking, and going right into the house without ever interacting with anyone. As you can see on the top right, uh, just some simple concepts, uh, basically four different home styles, each with attached and detached garages ranging from 1,100 to 1,900 square feet. And the clubhouse, uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 square feet. Um, you can fit a lot of people in there. It doesn't need to be too big. But with the features we'd like to include on the homes, uh, we'd love to incorporate renewable energy and put solar panels on, um, be beneficial to the community as well as uh, everyone in the greater met the metro area. And whether we include EV charging stations or just wire the homes to have that possibility, uh, would be nice, and we're also looking at potentially doing lead credited ho uh, homes and a neighborhood. So we'd be looking at uh, getting certified for each individual home as well as for the neighborhood um, that we're developing on the larger scale. Other amenities, uh, I mentioned the dog park, the clubhouse, um, may maybe put a dog washing station in the clubhouse, uh, kitchenette, Really, the, the op options are, um, there, there's infinite options of what can be done or could be done. Um, and with smart homes and this, adding these features, uh, you know, it would 
raise the price of, potentially raise the price of the homes. Um, we don't want to build homes that aren't affordable, and we don't want to build homes that don't fit into the surrounding neighborhood. Oops. And so with that, um, we will go, uh, we'll lead into discussion, um, but we are having this town, or this meeting tonight, as well as um, tomorrow night at Volume One uh, Summer Concert Series. We'll be a one night sponsor and just engaging people that walk by and want to talk about the concept that might be interested to get feedback. On the handout we gave you, um, there are, is a website on there, eauclairepocketneighborhood.com. Um, we have that website and hopefully it will be up tomorrow for people to access. And we have created a survey to get community feedback on housing preferences, what people would like to see, um, what they wouldn't like to see. And uh, the people that are interested or engaging with this, sort of what their backgrounds are and who's interested. Um, and so with that, uh, you have anything else I, to add? I don't think so. Just a pitch to take a postcard, visit the website, and take the survey, if you don't mind, and help us get that survey out. Um, to people and as Chris mentioned we'll be at volume one um, we'll be at the concert series tomorrow down at Phoenix Park um, for two or three hours we'll probably be getting there a little bit early um, to set up just to chat and talk to people one-on-one -on -one. so um, that's another opportunity to learn more about the project that was essentially our presentation we had we're hoping this would be a little bit more of a discussion and uh, um, I think, as Chris mentioned, some of the ideas for some of the amenities that we put out there were some things that we thought might fit in, but we wanted to kind of hear from the neighborhood, hear from people that might, there's probably here that live next door that are saying, what are these people crazy? Why are they going to do this? They're going to ruin our neighborhood. There's maybe other people here that are, maybe we want to live in a home like this. So we'd love to just hear any and all comments, you know, feedback, good, positive, or otherwise. Um, and we can uh, feed that into our development process as we move forward. Yes. I have a comment. Um, you had said that, that you want to have the detached garages, is that correct? Uh, yes, yeah, both attached and detached. Oh, okay, because I'm yeah. thinking that somebody in the retirement age is not going to want to trace through snow and ice to get to their house. Right. That was all I had. <laughs> Thank you. What is your definition of a single family home? Uh, she asked what was the definition of a single family home. <clears throat> so um, my definition of a single family home, uh, I guess uh, just a single standalone detached home that um, would typically serve you know, one household. And it would, uh, we're, we're looking primarily at um, kind of owner occupied as sort of the model we're looking at at this time, so. I still don't understand it. Are you saying like, a uh, couple that's married and their children, they could have five children, is a single family home? Yeah, a single uh, household is typically um, dependent upon the people that live there and people live in different uh -huh. circumstances. Yeah. So, so, so uh, I don't know that. One unit rather than a duplex. Um, oh, okay. We're generally looking at two, three bedrooms. Um, you know, could we do one with four? Um, could we do one bedroom homes? Sure. Uh, but. You know, there has to be people that are interested in that, and yeah. So you'll custom build them to the buyer? Uh, m more or less, we're looking at not having, totally doing custom homes. Um, we would have sort of our stock home, um, stock layouts and sizes, and then from there, we'd have a range of finishes for people to choose and customize their home. So how many people is that going to bring to our neighborhood? Uh, well, we're looking at 15 homes, okay. so I mean, it, if on average there's three people in a home, that's 45. Um, yeah. it, it's hard to say who the buyers are. That's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, around 50 people. Yeah, could could be. I think that I think the average household size in, is about 2.2. So if you just went by that average, you'd probably be talking 30 to 35 people. So where are you going to find the space for the? Uh, Dog park. I mean, dog parks are pretty big. All right. It it wouldn't be a, a large dog park. It'd be relatively small. Um, looking at the plan, I mean, the site is two acres, and it's that corner up above. So it's just somewhere to take your dog off leash, let them run around. Yes, it's not 
that big, oh, but well, it, the dog exercise yeah, that may yeah. be a better way of saying of framing it. Yeah. Yes. Um, according to the paper that you want to build on that lot, was, that was a hockey rink. Okay. Yep. And I understood this to be four houses. Where did they have other nine houses? Um, you want to flip back to that yeah. um, site layout? We can kind of show that. She asked uh, where were the houses going to go. You said you saw four houses. Um, and, it, and it is shown in the, hand, in the little postcard. We have a little site plan. But um, maybe, yeah. So here, this is First Street. This is the future park. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six homes fronting the park. Four homes in the back here. And then uh, one, two, three, four, five homes um, off to this side. This is the little area that Chris was referring to. If, again, if it was desired by the um, buyers, that could be a potential a little area, a little dog exercise area. Do you understand that that area that you're showing as the dog park is a hill? Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's, it is very small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, very. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that's, and that's a good point that this is still very high in the sky, just preliminary site plan, which would go through multiple evolutions. So we're, we're here to get that kind of feedback. Yes, we have walked the site. I do realize the topography. It, and there, there, there will be a lot of site work. Um, it, it was the hockey bullet, you know, the site at, towards the bottom slopes down from the street and is a little lower. And, but, but where your dog park is, is the corner of our lot. OK. So that's why we know exactly what it is. Yeah. I mean, you walk through those woods, it's very small. So your intent is, <clears throat> because it is a hill, and the north side of that is all trees, and to make your 2.8 acres that I mentioned in the paper, you would have to level that out. It, it, it probably wouldn't be leveled. It, there'd be sloping and yeah, it work into the grade. Um, I mean, yeah, right now this lot is a lot of trees. Um, yeah. well, so I don't mean the mess of weeds of trees. I'm talking about the bank. Mm -hmm. The North Bank is all developed trees. Are they going to go? Um, to make your 2.8? I think it's the, the, the two one, acres. What, two 1. acres. 1.9 acres 1. Is, is the site. Um, it, I mean, it, this is very preliminary. Um, it, as we go through, uh, we haven't hired you know, the firms that would tell us what's possible, what's really not possible. Um, so this is, there definitely will be alterations to the site plan. Well, I understand but, that, but I guess our, our input here is based on... So you're concerned about losing the grade and losing some of the trees up here, which... Maybe uh, all of them. Yeah. Make your Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good feedback. We have more questions back here. Let's keep moving. Yes. Uh, so just to clarify, these aren't rental properties. They're actually homes that are owned by the person in the house, right? Correct. That yeah. would be the yeah, right intent to sell these as owner occupied. Who does the um, lawn care and the snow removal and all of the maintenance that would have to happen during the, yep. the wintertime? We yeah. just had a really rough winter. Who's going to yeah, it, that's it, a good point. It would be done by um, a third party. Um, there would be a HOA or condo fee associated with home ownership. Yes? Uh, you probably are familiar with uh, the growth or growth housing project on Bainbridge Island off Seattle. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and I just happened to have been there last week. Okay. And those houses are much more, let's call it contemporary okay. in style. Okay. Yes, it's the West Coast, I understand. <laughs> But uh, do these houses have to be so traditional looking? No, and number one and number two, these houses right now, as they are laid out, basically conform with either horizontal or vertical lines. Mm -hmm. They're all not checkerboard, but uh, any 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 uh, angles have, are they possible to make it more interesting looking, more modern appeal? Uh, so Definitely. Uh, c could work with the site plan to sort of curve the homes around the common uh, space. Uh, the homes on the right we have on the east-west uh, for solar panels. Yeah. Um, so just thinking about that configuration. 
Yeah. And I, but I think as far as the style of the architecture, again, that's something that still is to come. And yeah. um, we're kind of showing what has been traditionally done, but I don't know that we're locked yeah. into a specific style. If you look at the parade of homes and line up, they're all the same cookie cutter approach with many gables because they're old fashioned style. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, my seatmate here mentioned it earlier on. Um, if they're all no basement, um, we're in an area of tornadoes. Where do they take shelter? Okay. Is uh, the community center going to have a basement for them to gather, or um, how do they secure themselves in their homes? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. So we'll. We'll, uh, we, we uh, personally, I, I haven't really thought of that. Um, so that, that's, that, that'll be something to think of. Yeah, yeah. Moving forward. And maybe that's an opportunity, like you said, if there was a if there's a clubhouse or community center here, maybe that could be done uh, structurally to to create a safe. Or just put basements. Or just put basements. In the floodplain. Think, that's not a flood, that's I think we're a It's my guess. So are you looking to get 15, get 15 buyers before you develop a site plan? Or, I mean, I, I see you're going to have 15 homes. Are you looking for 15 buyers before you develop this and see what everybody wants and then have a site plan? Or Yes and no. Um, we would be looking to pre-sell homes uh, before we start work on the site. Um, but we would have the site plan defined based on the responses um, that we're looking to get. Um, so would some of these people be more involved on the front end with the site plan? Yes, potentially. Um, but we don't plan to wait around to find 15 people just to figure out how everything's going to lay together. In the back. Yeah. Yeah, I'm watching kind of late, so I might not be little some step aside from the beginning. But one point is that he brought up about basements. And so that's a good idea because thinking about the fact that, okay, you're not going to have a tree to come through and wipe out everything is naive. Because it's happening. It's happened before. It will happen again. I am a certified train spotter, storm spotter, and change the weather service. So I know about these things, and you can, I can name off big cities until 9 o'clock where yep. people were like, yeah, they didn't think it was going to happen to them, and to do a certain amount of their topic level. Yeah. So, and around here, it's not you, in some ways, it's not that, it's the 80, 90 mile on Wednesday, 1980, for example, that comes through and takes out everything. So, but, and then the, the footing's have to be down how many feet down anyway, so, what's the, if you're going to dig that deep, hey, why not put a basement in there? Hey, I'm no construction engineer. I work, I work for a nice conservative company, so might be an idea. But I don't know how you're going to get that many buildings in the less small of an area. And this, that, this, I don't know your sense of scale. Like I said, I want this light. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> I just wanted to clarify, you talked about the concept of uh, mowing and snow removal handled by a third party. Mm -hmm. So there'd be a separate fee for that, like condo association? Right. Um, wh what we've been looking at so far would be somewhere between take care of everything, um, and there is a clubhouse and maintenance and such like that, uh, between $150, $200 a month. Okay. Are there going to be restrictions on the owners as to, say, what kind of drinks or whatever? Uh, on the interior, on the interior, no. Um, on the exterior, like the porch, um, you know, we would like every every home should have a porch. Um, we'd like people to take some personal ownership, do some landscaping around their home. Um, but yes, we we have right to, we have yet to write the uh, you know the sort of zoning code for it and um, the agreements for the association. Right. Yeah. Yes. How how affordable will these houses be? Are they accessible to low income people? 
people or does it benefit low income people that live around the yep. area? It will be market market rate homes um, for the most part is what we're looking at. Uh, we are exploring the option of some affordable homes as well. Um, so we are taking that into consideration. We're trying to work through that and uh, how that really happens, whether it's through tax credits or other avenues. Um, so we, we would like to see a mix of housing. Um, bringing new construction homes to the area already will add a mix of housing to the area. Um, we do want to be sensitive of the community. We don't want to start displacing people that are already in the neighborhood. Yeah. Do you have a ballpark number for scale of price, approximately? Uh, not necessarily. Um, yeah, N not really. Uh, it, no, we're look, we've been looking at somewhere between um, under 200 to over 300 in the range. Yes. What about encouraging and what about traffic through the neighborhood as far as you know, people coming in and out of there? Mm hmm. Um, we, there, they have over, they park in their right. There's no driveway to park in. Um, we'd be looking at uh, street parking. Um, our, our idea is that it is more walkable. People, you know, will be. Um, walking, biking in the neighborhood. The park is right there. Um, so yeah, parking uh, is an option, but the idea with this is to reduce uh, the use of cars and sort of limit their ability to function within this community um, and the neighborhood. But they still gotta come in and out of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. you know, still gonna be a lot of traffic. Yeah. So what do these communities do to the property values around them? Uh, Good question. Traditionally, new construction homes um, do help raise property values, um, not significantly. Uh, it depends on more development or you know, if rehabilitation is happening around as well. Um, so c could this bring more investment to the neighborhood? Yes, uh, definitely. Um, there are other sites in the Cannery District that may be developed into higher density um, than this. Um, but as for property values, um, it, it's hard to say. It, I, I wouldn't see them going, going down. Uh, the West Coast ones are interesting because they're sort of generally little one-off communities. Um, but for the most part, uh, it doesn't have a significant impact on property values one way or the other. Yes? I've seen some of uh, the ones that are in the Seattle area called Daughter lives out there. And um, they generally, the ones that I've been into, because we've been interested in this concept, um, the ones that I've seen fit into the neighborhoods pretty well. Um, they've, uh, and you brought up the, the uh, having a newer look, the ones that I've seen have really, um, most of the houses have, have been built to look similar to the neighborhoods. So it's not like this pocket that, that stands out all by itself, but does uh, somewhat conform to have an older style to them. But the ones I've seen have been more where they're spread out all along the edge, so they mm -hmm. face in all face into each other. They all yep. have porches, and that green space in the middle that is bigger um, and uh, done to uh, so neighbors get to know neighbors, kind of, and for people with kids or people with animals or people that's the ones that stay home, you know, maybe home more. They're all kind of watching out for each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, um, that's a good point. I guess I just, quickly piggyback, I mean, I think you get a little bit of a sense, there's probably neighborhoods in Eau Claire that are sort of like that organically, naturally. Sometimes you'll see older neighborhoods with real and narrow streets and that street almost functions like that common green space. You can talk to the neighborhood. I live in in Appleton is like that with a narrow street. I can talk to neighbors on their porch across the street. Kids play in the street, cars go slow. So it's trying to create that kind of feel um, is what we're trying to do. And I, I don't know who was first here, but you haven't asked a question yet. I'm, I'm wondering about the 
process, um, and then I have a question about the layout. You've, you've talked about there might be some um, lower, uh, in, lower, more affordable homes as part of the selection, and you're going to make some decisions as you're developing your plan. How are we going to stay in contact with, with these decisions that you're making and how this is developing? Will that be online? Can we watch? Kind of a timeline of yes. what's, yeah, we, that's, I, yeah. We, we've started to, uh, people have started to reach out to us um, that are interested in whether it's just be, staying informed or they're interested in the concept um, and want to know more. And uh, so we have started to create a list um, uh, that of people that we would email out to. Uh, we are creating that website, Eau Claire Pocket Neighborhood, uh, sort of as the one-stop shop to put all the information out there. Um, that anyone may be interested in. So if you check that website, um, that should so be up, so updated. So ready to make your presentation to the redevelopment authority, we kind of, we kind of have a sneak peek of what that might look like? Right, definitely, okay. yeah. So then um, I happen to have been at the meeting when you talked about what, what you were thinking about and you specifically said you were not interested in gentrification. Mm -hmm. So are, are you, will it be a conscious choice to try to match some of the, the right. one story, two story, or will it, will it really flop in the direction of, I really want this big house near the river and, that, and that's what we get? Hey, we want to stay smaller homes. Okay. Um, and with gentrification, uh, you know, that happens when there's a housing shortage. Um, so this would bring home more homes to the neighborhood, um, and uh, so there would be more homes there. And if we're doing that, and the neighborhood starts to turn, um, you know, future developers in the city uh, should be conscious of that and include more affordable housing options in their uh, developments. Uh, the best neighborhoods are diverse neighborhoods, um, especially socioeconomic. We're not trying to create, um, especially even in this concept we don't want you know all the same socioeconomic class buying these homes talked about in that presentation that there might be this might be the center of two other residential developments uh well the, there there's uh other sites in the cannery district like that the rda owns that um, will be up for development uh yeah we're sort of last, first to the table is on, on your site plan there the lower right-hand corner, am I seeing that th those are actually facing the street, is that? Is Correct. That right? Yeah, they, they'd be facing the street and looking out over the park. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, so if it's owner, um, you own the home, correct? Right. Okay, so how do you determine the footprint of the ground space that you will have for yourself in the community because that determines your taxes. Your footprint as well as your home determines. So how do you divide up this each community? Each home would have relatively um, the same size parcel and the rest of the space would be owned by the association. Um, so you know, your individual home will be valued and taxed as such, um, and the common space will be uh, valued and taxed as such as well. So when you mention the HOA fees um, covering the clubhouse as well as the um, lawn and snow removal and so forth, you said about 150 to 200 dollars approximately per month. I mean, yeah, per month. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Taxes, insurance, um, yeah. So the 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 real value uh, of the land would be in the homes themselves, um, and because they have access, because they're part of the association, they have access to uh, the rest of the area. That value would be included in that. But the that, that the individual homeowners would still pay their individual tax bills the, by themselves. Property yes. tax bills. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but what I was asking was if. Know the HOA fee is going to cover that community center um, and the removal of the snow and, and the lawn care and whatnot. Um, that 150 to 200 
would it also include um, the taxes of the general common space? Right. You anticipated yes. Being yes. Sir? <clears throat> How much control of the individual property owners or who would um, have the deciding factor on what could be in the green space? Like if the family wanted to have a place set outside or a waiting pool or just a sandbox or something, mm -hmm. who would be able to decide where that could go and what? That? That's something we'd uh, try to fit in on the front end. Um, you know, if there should be a playground in here. We design it to include a playground. Um, the common space really would be just open space. Uh, could, would write into the association that you know, if there's X amount of space and people want to put in a community garden or a farm, um, that would be acceptable. But it would be um, it, it would be chosen by the association as a whole. Not on the common space. Would they have any space of their own? Yeah, they, they'd have um, you know some space in their front, a sort of small front yard, um, have a side yard. So I guess I would piggyback on that as you know as we work through this process. Um, given the configuration of the access points, you know we're going to end up with certain parcels or portions of the site that might be a little bigger than others. And so if we've got an interest and in people coming forward with kids and ideas and wanting more space, you know, there may be, um, you know, there's going to be certain lots here, probably going to be a little bit bigger than others. Typically, I know, I mean, on the, again, neighborhood I live in, we have a lot of homes that sit on smaller lots, they're 3,000 square feet. We're talking um, two acres, 15. So we, we still have a decent sized lot for these homes where you'd be able to at least have, you know, typically even on a smaller lot like that, there's enough room for like a little playground set or a you know, a small enclosed, you know, per private yard. Um, in the back. Two questions. She had mentioned uh, that there were two or three other ones that you wanted to set up. Is that on vacant lots or you can be buying out homes? Uh, well, well, we, we are not, um, personally, as a firm, we are not really looking at other oh, sites okay. to, to do this here. And then uh, another question. If all this goes through, when do your estimated, like, start? Uh, we would love to be starting later this year um, and finishing next year. Um, if everything moves forward, um, that could be extended. Yes? Uh, piggybacking on this, for families that have a couple of children, where would be the, the nearest playground? Uh, across the street at the park. The so yeah, we'll Cannery District. Okay, and then for people who need certain access, accessibility accommodations, people with like wheelchairs or walkers, would that be a customized feature then if they purchase a property? Um, I don't know so much customized. Um, if someone is interested in that and interested in having a home, we'd encourage them to work with us directly um, to take care of that. Yes. I'm just wondering if the uh, City County Health Department has done a health impact uh, assessment. Are you aware Correct. of that? Correct. Yes. For the Cannery District and also the city has a comprehensive plan. It seems like both of those emphasize the need for uh, additional low income housing, even for families that have 58% of the area median income. This doesn't really add to that. It's more on the higher end of that missing middle. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like it'd be better supported if you demonstrated that it was in alignment with those two documents that have already, a lot of people have spent a lot of time uh, making it. And if there were some plan for um, you know, additional housing that would meet the need for low-income families. I guess I, I'll, I can take a stab at that one. Um, I guess big picture, I, I guess, and I, maybe, I don't know if we can zoom out, but if we looked at the whole downtown area and the neighborhoods in and adjacent to downtown, you have a lot of low income housing already. So having a, pockets of newer market rate homes in some ways helps create more of that income diversity or, or housing diversity. Um, I would, 
I guess the other little point I'd say is, you know, depending on the city's appetite for helping subsidize some of the units, you know, that's a conversation, I guess, as Chris could mention, um, we may be able to add some more affordable units in here. And then I guess finally, I think solving, really solving that, um, you know, this is one little tiny um, parcel or block within, you know, kind of your broader downtown area. So I, I think looking at it holistically too, if on the, I'm not as familiar with your specific, you know, housing, affordable housing needs here, but I'm sure there's similar to a lot of our communities I've worked at. Um, this may not be the best solution to create affordable housing. The, econ ec the economics of scale, the amount of work that detailed site work that goes into this particular housing product may not be the best match for affordable housing. So just because of the construction costs and the overhead costs, it may make more sense to try to achieve truly, you know, generate larger quantities of newer affordable housing and doing something different than this. So I'm not sure that this construction method necessarily lends itself real well to. And, and looking at this site, um, we have been looking at affordable housing and exploring that avenue and looking at tax credits, uh, such as new market tax credits. This census tract unfortunately does not qualify for those tax credits. Uh, the neighborhoods to the south do, uh, the neighborhoods all around downtown do. Unfortunately, this one's about four blocks outside of the census tract that would qualify. Can I just jump in a second on that too? So when we had our meeting roughly a year or two ago, we had a community gathering of about 100 people, and they all voted that for this cannery district, they wanted to see a mixture of different types of housing, affordable, market, elderly, et cetera. This is one of our largest redevelopment districts, and there's plenty of room for all of that. Um, WIDA, which get, does a lot of the low-income housing and workforce housing, um, will have their next round of financing in December. So I'm already got lots of developers that are sniffing around for sites for affordable housing too. Um, the city is looking at that uh, with the transit center. Um, so we are definitely keeping that in mind. We know that, the, that it's a want of a lot of people, um, but in this district, we're probably gonna see a, a wide variety of different housing. And so, you know, keep in mind that further projects may come forward that have more of that component to it. That's helpful to know <laughs> in, in terms of support. And it, it, it'd be helpful to know that this is aligned with that plan and with the, right. the uh, health impact assessment. Because from our perspective, um, there may be, it may appear to an outsider that there's lots of low income housing around the downtown area, but from you know, so when we see that, all the development in downtown has not been low income. Right. It's all been market. Yeah, new stuff. And it's gentrifying, it's rising rents, I mean, causing rents to rise, and it's probably gonna uh, push people out if it yeah. hasn't already. Yeah, and, and the housing stock right now that is affordable um, could be better if new development came in um, and offered that option. Yeah. So part of, part of the, the the city county health impact assessment is try to help people help people stay in their homes if there are new developments right. come in, I, and steady programs that improve their houses or whatever. Uh, and, and studies um, have been done. Uh, probably the best one is looking at Denver's public housing. Uh, they have uh, you apply for public housing, you get placed literally anywhere in Denver, and the public housing options range the entire spectrum from high income neighborhoods to low income neighborhoods. And they've done studies that uh, low income families that move into higher income neighborhoods generally do better. Um, and it's not just better for them, it's better for the community that they move into. So it's really important to have that spectrum and that diversity of housing. Yes. I didn't catch your name. Are you my shots? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so have you been in touch also in your conversations we, about? We, uh, we have been working with the city from day one. Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is did you also talk about potential adding bike paths that, that facilitates uh, getting to downtown from there along Madison or whatever? Yes. Sir. Uh, number one. Number two, uh, at this point, as far as I know, this neighborhood, I'm not from this neighborhood. But it's it's relatively speaking a food desert. And I can I, I see myself going a quick trip to buy myself. Right. Yeah. So will there be is there a plan for developing a supermarket in that area or something like that? It, it, it's one of the number one things that downtown is trying to accomplish. And, and uh, as you know, and 
we mentioned, the whole area is a food desert. So um, one of the projects that we're working on is just local foods. Um, but certainly we talk to as many grocery stores as we can. Um, they have their own wants and needs and income guidelines and things like that. But uh, uh, it's certainly something that is on our wish list. Uh, we even had a, uh, one of our major goals of downtown including right. us to so yeah, it, it, it'll, it'll always be on our priority list. And I think as, as you see more of this redevelopment that's happening in our community in downtown, and the more housing units you bring to the downtown, it'll just more lead to someone wanting to open something as we keep getting more people here and our income levels rise to make it uh, feasible for them. Yeah. And uh, answering your question on bikes, um, I'm a huge proponent of bike infrastructure. Uh, our firm actually writes newsletters uh, periodically, and we just came out with our most recent one today. I wrote an article in there about bike infrastructure in Milwaukee and how it's lacking um, and ways to improve that um, and the benefits that come with bike infrastructure. So I'm a huge proponent. I would love to see dedicated bike lanes, protected lanes um, throughout, but unfortunately I don't control the uh, public realm. So. But you have these influences. Right, definitely, yeah. Yes. So does a neighborhood like this like have its own like name? And you know, like a stone sign you come into it if you're coming into something fancy subdivision right. or whatever? Um, no, we, we haven't thought of a name. Um, and because we do want it to blend in with the neighborhood, probably will not. Yes. Yeah. I just thought I'd comment. One, there is a bike path that just went on right here. If you're proposing that, it leads right to it. Uh, walk, walk, bike path. And then, two, the parking on First Street is pretty bad, um, especially in the winter when people park on both sides and they have snow banks. It's like a one lane. And mm -hmm. where you're proposing to put that, it's also where the bridge is, and that's a hill. And that's a pretty bad like, safety spot, especially in the winter when it kind of seems like it's a one and a half lane due to traffic mm -hmm. and the snow banks. Going over that hill, you never know what you're coming into. Right. Yeah, it, it's hard to find a right solution um, for everything. So that's definitely something we will be looking at. Um, and if, you know, from here, it's a 15, 20 minute walk to Phoenix Park. Um, it's very close to downtown. If there, people are working downtown and living here, living close, um, walking and biking is an option. It's close to public transportation, bus stops. Um, Myself, I recently so sold my car, no longer have that expense. I walk and bike everywhere. Um, I walk th 35 minutes to work and from work every day. Um, so, it, yes, yes, we have to be mindful of cars, but um, it's important to focus on the other options as well. So. I can jump in again. Um, wearing my city hat, our traffic engineer and our city engineer are looking at all those traffic patterns We're doing kind of the attraction of development and stuff. They're doing the, the safety issues and how to do the safety and the parking. Par parking, is our, parking is one of our uh, strong points. We have committees after committees of dealing with parking. So, we, uh, we have so, so is that going to be fixed before this comes in? So whenever we do a redevelopment district, we have to figure out the financing portion of it too. So we look at how are we going to do that. Is that through our capital improvement project uh, program or is it through a tax incremental financing district? But one way or the other, we know if we're going to be promoting these new developments and stuff, we have to no, fix the road. question was, are you going to take care of the pedestrian crossing and parking and the road before they put this development in? Um, that is probably something that the end I would have to have the engineers answer that, what the timing of that is. You don't want to spend a lot of money and do something that has to be torn up later. So trying to coordinate it at the same time, maybe at the, the time the park is put in, or maybe at the time the development is put in, we, we do that at the same time to keep you know expenses as low as possible. So I was just thinking with space being single family homes, most single family homes, roughly anywhere from one to three children per home. Has there been any discussion as to whether the nearby schools can handle that uh, 
possibly the flex of children? Uh, to my knowledge, I don't think we've looked at that. I don't know if the city has any sense off the top of your head of you what the impact would be on the local school. If, uh, there's been a, been a discussion as to whether the nearby schools would be able to handle the possible influx of that many children coming into the area. But roughly, if these are single family homes, you should expect to pay for some hundreds of children for all truth. Here, I'll answer that. I'm not a demographic credit committee for the school district. This number of students is not a concern whatsoever relative to the number of kids in the school. Um, sure. There's over capacity, and this is part of the north side of the town. There's under capacity at every one of the elementary schools for the most part on the north side. So, and then by the time you get to middle school, it's kind of a big difference. So schools, little or no way. Anybody else that has had a chance to ask a question want to chime in? Um, these types, what are these types of neighborhoods like? Uh, is there like a component to it that would, I mean, there's a park on the other side of the street, but are there other components to it that would make it like um, draw in other members of, of the community to look at, such as like opportunities for like public art or anything like that? Are those types of things usually built into these neighborhoods or how does that how does that work especially in this community with yeah strong you know art culture here. um you know it, with the sculpture tour if they end up doing sculptures along the cannery district park um if they could through a sculpture in, in this development that would be awesome um it, the community space could be used by artists or uh you know have a weekly a knitting class or a painting class or something like that. So, you know, it could benefit uh, those opportunities, but it depends on you know, who's putting that together and yeah, it, who's interested, who participates. Yeah. So, one, yeah. I got two questions. I understand this is going to take place. That's quite some thing, correct? I'm sorry? This project we're talking about is actually going to take place, or are we just discussing it? It should take place. Um, I think we're in the pre, we're in the very beginning stages trying to get input from the community. Uh, we're already talking about the time for houses and how we're going to pay for this and who's going to pay for that. So, it's just a general question. Uh, we, we've been working on this for a while, so the idea is yes, that this will move forward and it will exist in some, some way. The other thing, which is never brought up, is when we talk about security or law enforcement. The number one thing for criminal activity is opportunity. Build a project like that, you're just going to open up opportunity for criminal activity. You think about that. In what way? In what way? For one thing, they have a state plan. They go across the bridge and forest and Hobart. It's go right here. They go into a neighborhood like that with all those fancy homes everybody's talking about, and they start ripping them off. They're going to be gone like that. I guarantee it. But no one talked about security. Will the association have a security system? You want to talk about law enforcement? Mm -hmm. You ever think about that? I mean, you can't tell me you're standing up there and you're supposed to be an educated young man. Crime, right. well, happens, it, like crime happens everywhere. In my neighborhood, my car window was smashed just uh, not too long ago. Right. Yeah. Well, the uh, other. It, 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 right. Project. Yeah. I'm not saying this is a bad project. The, you're giving them, I'm talking. Um, the homes we're looking at design would be smart homes. They'd be integrated with uh, security systems for the homes. Um, but yeah, it, crime happens everywhere, and uh, yeah, it's you know hopefully neighbors are looking out for one another and officers are driving by. But you don't have an answer to my question. Not necessarily, no. I can just say from the redevelopment standpoint and from the city standpoint, we do look at it. We have development teams that the law enforcement are part of those review teams, the fire inspectors are. When we design out of the Phoenix Park, for example, where we put the road in between, again, it was for access for police and fire uh, opening areas so that they could view it and there weren't any hidden areas. So they do have an input when we have designs that come forward if there's a site plan review and things like that. Um, law enforcement is uh, certainly a part of everything. Is law enforcement, I understand, tackling our neighborhood? 
if this gets to the point where it goes through those processes, they will be a big, big part of that review. But, um, we have found, and they will tell you, when, when we brought um, some of these concepts that are back there by the cannery district, they they chimed in on what they thought and how it would be easier for them to um, monitor the areas. Um, as Chris said, the more people that are living there, the more eyes you have on your neighborhood. And uh, I can tell you right now, some of the, some of the activity that goes along uh, this area now without people living here uh, will go away compared to we have neighborhoods there and people watching out for each other and, and looking at it. So. Yes. Let me just add to what just Mike said, you know, and I'm an idealist, maybe hopeless idealist, maybe a humanist, whatever, but I believe that the, the more we can create a true diversity, as you don't point out, you know, in this neighborhood, involving not just this particular development, but the, but the, the neighborhood around it, and know the people, the more we, we will look out for each other, and that will, I think, immediately, well, over time, uh, discourage anybody else to commit crimes in there. Of course, yes, it will happen, but I think a good neighborhood that works together and is integrated along different social levels, I think will take care of itself. Can I just ask out of curiosity, how many people are from this neighborhood or immediately nearby? Okay, so about half of you. Okay. I want to know who exactly lives around this pocket housing that's here today? I live on mine. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, if you don't mind. Exactly. Who lives here, 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 we live here. So who does this actually, who's actually here that lives right here in this area? Nobody's here? So we're the only ones that are here. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add too, this is not exactly, this is not exactly a cute neighborhood, yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. Did you say $300,000? Uh, yeah, but below two to above three. Yeah. That ain't going to happen here. You'll never get anybody in there that's going to pay $100 to $200 a month just to live there, plus the house. This guy back here is right about the crime. Plus the crime, mm -hmm. yeah. He is because across the river is nothing but crime, and they paint it when they. When they came up with this idea, we said, you're just driving the, um, they built the high bridge, they're just making it a portable yes. for the park to do drug deals. It's just the stupidest thing ever. I like the high bridge myself. Yeah. The, the prices are what you would see on the sell side in suburban homes that aren't selling right now. I mean, smart homes are nice, but you need affordable housing that people are actually going to be living in this neighborhood. And quite frankly, under 300,000, no way in hell. What do you guys, what do you think would be a market rate? What do you think people are willing to pay for a brand new home? And a well, I don't think it's what people are willing to pay. It's what kind of income do they have that they can afford to pay. But they're not asking for our neighborhoods to move into that. They're asking for the south side neighborhoods to come make our neighborhood what they visualize it to be. So they visualize that part to bring everybody together. Well, it's not going to happen because Southside people will never come down to this part because of all the drug and everything now that they've made that bridge so. I, I rent on the South Side and I'm interested in buying in this neighborhood. And I live on the South Side, same thing. I'm an attorney, I do criminal events, so I know exactly what sort of neighborhood I would be buying into. But I'm not doing it for $200,000. Like, I can't afford a home like that. I'm thinking mm -hmm. 100 to 150,000, and 150,000 is high. Especially with another 150, $200 HOA fees for someone to tell me what I'm gonna do with my, my property. Like, that, that's a lot. Yeah. And you're an attorney, so things about the people who don't have that. Yeah, exactly. Totally I mean, I know what neighborhood I'm, I'm looking to integrate into, but it, it, it is a rough yeah. neighborhood, and this is something that we would have to work to, to address. 
New construction is inherently more expensive, um, and it would be it would be impossible to build for 100 to 150. Well, was, yes. thanks for not holding back. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> now's the time to, to know these things, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yes. Well, I hear some of the same arguments that were offered about the Phoenix Park neighborhood and that nobody from anywhere would ever want to live there or move there. And, you know, look at it now. Yeah, but they clean that whole neighborhood. They clean that whole neighborhood. This is vacant space. We're not displacing anybody, number one. We own an apartment. She asked if anybody lives here. On first, the, in the middle of the block at 2214, there's a yellow yep. four unit building. Mm -hmm. We built that, we own that. Mm -hmm. We have not had any complaints of tenants having vandalism or any crime problems there. And we get, and we get the crime reports automatically from the police department as a property owner. And yeah, it's, and look at the map in the leader telegram that comes up on some of It's, you know, it's everywhere, but it doesn't have to be with people sensing a community feeling where they know who belongs around there and what's going on. And a diverse group doesn't mean everybody goes to bed at 8 o'clock, nor does everybody come rolling in at our closing time. It, you know, it, it's, it's a, somebody's around all the time. And I just, I think it's a great concept. It's different. And as you improve parts of neighborhoods, especially parts that aren't displacing anybody, you're not tearing down any existing older homes. You know, you're starting out new. And you have those advantages of being close to downtown. There was nothing wrong in our neighborhood to begin with. Is somebody renting is a different cost versus someone owning the property, paying the taxes, and so forth. I mean, you know, when you're talking about the lower income homes and maybe in that area, they're often rental properties, and so you are paying a different price versus someone who owns their home and has more invested in it. Um, and that's why I, I think this young lady is correct. I think if you're looking to bring people into that area, you're going to have to make things more affordable, just maybe because of the area it's in. Now, if you're building it somewhere, else maybe, you know, Claire, you might get your upper echelon cost, but, you know, kind of in this area, I, I don't think you'll get that cost there. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, again, when I heard you make the presentation to the RDA, you talked about possibly building modular. Right. And that that might... That, that could could significantly, uh, significantly decrease the price, um, so purchase price of a home. Could you maybe give some alternatives, like if this would be stick built versus modular, so people? Can De oh, that? definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. We have um, meetings and tours scheduled with builders um, coming up, and we will work with them to design and work on that efficiency and pricing. Um, with modular, there is a negative con connotation with modular building, um, especially because manufactured homes are built in the same type of environment um, and almost a, in a very similar process. Um, modular homes can be very high-end, they can be very customizable, and when they're built in a factory and not in site, you can get things down to precisions that you can't see in, on, when built on site, so they can be uh, potentially higher quality homes than would be built on site. So are you feeling courageous to kind of 
go out of what, what might be a ballpark price. Um, so I'm saying a, a two bedroom modular. Like a, a two bedroom, 1,100 square foot modular home. Um, uh, it could be, depending on all the site costs and the amenities that go into it, um, that could be, let's say, call it a, somewhere between 150, 170 bucks a square foot. So 160,000 and up. Yes? There are a couple of uh, trends that I've seen online regarding new properties. Uh, one of them is people, especially around the farming communities, farmers that have made it and you know, have accumulated some retirement, um, sometimes will buy a property in town in order to vacation here at a certain time of the year and uh, leaving it vacant for other parts of the year. Um, another trend that I've seen is people buying properties um, and essentially renting them out as Airbnbs. So is it, is there, are there anything, is there anything in your order? We, we would be, uh, look, looking at potentially imposing restrictions um, where uh, could you rent the home? Yes. Uh, could you rent it for less than a certain period of time? No, and that would take take out the Airbnbs. Would be available to, um, for rental. It, for to rent uh, uh, yes, the, the yes um, that's not decided yet, but yeah, it's definitely a possibility, um, you know. Well, typically cities don't regulate that if you have a, I don't know what the city's policy is in Eau Claire, but typically you don't yeah. regulate if somebody wants to rent their house out, they, they can. So you can regulate the Airbnb type things, but you can't regulate someone from wants to rent their house out. Their house out. Cool. Yeah. So in terms of like your, your question about whether this is going to be owner occupied, that's their intent to sell for that. But six months later, if they turn around and rent it out, we state law prevents you from um, enforcing that. They can have covenants, which prevent that, but then that's neighbors suing neighbors to enforce it. And so that's that's a different association. Different animal 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 animal. What's that? Does the neighborhood association have something to say about that? Yes. Uh, no. the, 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 yeah, the, this association for this development would have yeah, something to say. So yeah. So are enforced between neighbors and not enforced by the city. So they have an association already picked out. Ooh. They have to. Yeah. What happens if the people that live in that area start out with an association and then they don't want to? It, it, the association would exist. Um, it would be if you wanted to disband that association, then someone would have you'd have to re sort of redo the entire neighborhood so that someone owns certain parts. It it's not realistic. Anything else? Uh, appreciate everybody coming back. Yeah. I just, I just, uh, we talked about cost. Um, now that our country seems to be in some sort of terraform, are you concerned about the possibility of rapidly rising construction materials? Uh, not necessarily materials. Um, you know, it'd be stick frame housing. Uh, it's not steel homes. Um, but one reason we are looking at modular is because of the uh, shortage of skilled labor and rising construction costs. Any other questions? All right, so with that, um, we'll end it. Uh, we'll stick around if you want to come up and ask a question or chat uh, personally. So thank you. Appreciate it. Newsworks is made possible by continuing community support. 
If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, please contact us via phone at 715-839-5067 or online at valleymediaworks.org.